Hey gang, check it out. Austin Music Foundation is excited to share the first five songs from year four of our artist development program, available exclusively on Bandcamp. Five brand new original singles from DZ Brown, Aubrey Hayes, Drent, Pelvis Wrestling, and Stone Wheels. Your $5 donation will help Austin Music Foundation continue leading the way in producing innovative, career-advancing programs, including the Artist Development Program. Every dollar over the suggested donation will go directly to these worthy artists. Check it out today at austinmusicfoundation.bandcamp.com. That's austinmusicfoundation.bandcamp.com. Get involved. Gang, we all know Spotify has become the ultimate app destination for music lovers. I have an account and I love it. I find new music by following Tastemaker playlists and I make my own playlist that I share featuring music from guests that have been on the show. But did you know that aside from millions of songs, Spotify now has thousands of podcasts? All your favorites are on there, including How Did I Get Here? That's right. We are on Spotify. Just go to Spotify.com or download the app from your app store. And don't forget to follow How Did I Get Here? That's Spotify. Millions of songs, now thousands of podcasts. Start listening now. And you may ask yourself, well, how did I get here? It's time for... How did I get here? And now here is your host. Unbody. All right, hello. I'm Johnny. I'm your host. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for listening. I am back. I'm back in the apartment. I'm back in the studio doing the intros. I spent three weeks down in Galveston with my family, quarantining together in a house on a beach. It was unbelievable. It was unbelievable. It was really, really gorgeous. It was phenomenal getting to spend that much time with the people that I love the most in the world. Um, most of them, you know. We were all in one house together. Bunch of dogs, bunch of people, people making food. I put a, uh, If you follow me on Instagram, you saw a bunch of sunrises, sunsets, beautiful beach stuff. It was gorgeous. It was hard to get stuff done. I had planned to sort of like get some get some songwriting done, but man, you can't write a song living in a house with a bunch of people. I mean, it's not bad. Look, I needed I needed a break, and uh, I took a break. I did some work while I was there. I did some of the podcast intros and stuff. I worked with Austin Music Foundation for a couple of weeks while I was there, uh, pretty intensely, and did some skyrocket. Uh, did a video for a skyrocket show, but otherwise, I was just hanging out, and I was. I was pretty much drunk by the afternoon every day. Pretty much every day. I mean, my but we drank a lot while I was there. I haven't I haven't had a drink since I've been back. I've been drying it out. I came back uh the day after Christmas. Christmas was great, man. We did a no presents Christmas. We just man, you know, I gotta tell you, it really means so much to me. My grandmother's ninety seven. I got to spend three weeks with her, hanging out every day. Just chilling. No big whoop. You know, hanging out with my aunt Olga. My Aunt Christina, my Uncle Chuck, my cousin Emily a lot, my cousin Eric, his wife Tessa, cousin Jennifer, her her fiance Ryan, my cousin Megan, her husband Adam, their child uh, Max, whose name was changed to Machito. I actually had to think of what his actual name was. We were all calling him Machito. I don't know. He man, he's a cutie. It was great. It was just great being with family. So anyway, and being in paradise. I know most of you are laughing at me when I say Galveston is paradise, but compared to like you know your apartment. Living on the beach is pretty rad. And uh, I want to thank my grandma and my family for doing that. It was great. It was really, really great. We had our tense moments. You know, there was a couple moments of tension. There's going to be when there's three people, you know, all those people living for three weeks in a house. All the dogs, too, man. The dogs were nuts. There's old dogs, young dogs, dogs freaking out, dogs pissing everywhere. It was insane. Anyway, great time at the beach. All right. And now I'm back. And Christmas happened. I hope you guys had a good Christmas. I did not put out a show on Christmas Day. I only put out one show last week because it was getting to the last, my last few days there. And I was like, man, I don't even want to sit down and try and do this intro. I just want to hang out with my family. So uh, that's what I did. 
just hung out with them the whole time. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to drop three shows this week, and today is uh, is the first of those shows. My friend Nick Parr from the band The Selfless Lovers, they're releasing a new album, a 12-song album, recorded a tape, live to tape, at Fifth Street Studios here in Austin. It's called When the Bars Close. They have some songs out right now from it. You can find them at self theselflesslovers.com. Fantastic conversation, man. Uh, uh, Nick sent me some questions to ask him because I guess he did, he was worried I was going to be unprepared, but I was prepared, man. And I did some of his questions too because he did he did go out on tour playing saxophone with uh, with Roxy Roca in their horn section, which I know is a whole different thing than doing your own thing all the time. And uh, they'll be playing on uh, January 9th here in Austin at Whiskey Tango Foxtrot. They're actually playing a bunch of shows. I mean. Kind of freaks me out. I don't know. We're at stage five, so hopefully this uh, Whiskey Tango Foxtrot place is outside. But go to theselflesslovers.com. Find out when they're playing. You can see videos. You can hear music from their new album, When the Bars Close. Uh, But for now, enjoy my conversation with the amazingly talented Nick Parr from the band The Selfless Lovers. Let's get down. Out on the road tonight Feels like the world's losing its mind Look, I'm not gonna lie. I think it's weird that is this your first Zoom encounter? <laughs> so I've done like one. Okay. The whole COVID, I've done one, and it went smooth. It was it was better, but I set it all up in advance, and I was ready. I thought I was ready this time, but I really am not good at it. I'm afraid of it. So you got ready for somebody else, but not for your old pal Johnny. Dude, I got ready for you, man. I had a, <laughs> I had the lights. I had the lights set up. I brewed a cup of coffee. I was ready. I was ready to go. But anyways, thanks, man. Thanks for being cool. Have you been doing under... Uh, you've been playing gigs and stuff. Yeah. We've just been doing like outdoor stuff like at beer gardens or, you know, places where people can basically spread out social distance. So like places in the park. We'll go play a concert series in some park somewhere in some small town. Like stuff like that. Or some beer garden out on the ocean where there's a big outdoor deck. Stuff like that. Yeah. Was, uh, did you really play Yaga's? Yeah, we did. That one was weird Dude, because they have like a capa- they have a capacity thing, right? So they have like a really low capacity, and they had all the windows open, and no one could dance. So it was like really freaking strange. I played Yagas on the Strand the first when? time in the su- the first time in the summer of 1989. Whoa! Thirty one years ago. Whoa! Yeah. That that's crazy. Yeah. Was it pretty cool back then? Yeah. <laughs> Why? Is it not cool now? I mean, I see I it mean, when I'm down in Galveston. I'll be walking by it when I'm walking down the strand going to the candy place that I love where yeah, they make the, the candy. <laughs> that's the excuse. You go book a show at Yaga so you can go to the candy spot. Shit, yeah, that's man. The, that's the way to do it. Um, Now it, it's fine. I mean, I'm glad we get booked there. You know, I appreciate it. But I just think nightlife has changed so much. So people just want to go hear DJs and shit. They want to hear DJs even under COVID? Yeah, it's weird out in Galveston, man. I mean, like I said, they're all each each town has its own rules, right? So, like in Galveston, they can go listen to a DJ, but they can't dance, and they have capacity rules. So you basically have people drinking, <laughs> sitting at tables with DJ music playing. Oh yeah, that's weird. It's weird. It kind of feels like a sci-fi novel or something, you know? Are you playing down there at all in December? I'm not, but I've done it before where they have their big, what is it, their Charles Dickens festival Yeah, thing. yeah, Dickens on the Strand, baby. I remember it, we did it last year, and I like showed up, and I had no idea what was happening, and I showed up to play Yagas, and there's people walking around in 18th century garb. You're not a costume guy. I mean, a Halloween is one thing, but you know those people that like for everything they go to, they have a costume for it? Yeah, yeah. There's people I don't trust those people, stuff. man. I don't trust them. <laughs> Why not? Do you think they're hiding something? Yeah, something weird is going on in there. I don't want to hear about it. (laughs) Um, So wait a minute. So you've been touring small Texas towns. You sent me. You sent me a very good list of of uh, of items to talk about. I found in an email today. 
Yeah, I wasn't trying to like control your life. I just thought that we haven't hung out in a while, so we had shit we could talk about. Maybe. Well, I that's don't know. what I was thinking about. It's funny because this morning I was walking. And I was thinking, like, when was the last time I even saw Nick? At one point, we were, like, bros, seeing each other places. And then all of a sudden, you... Last thing I, I remember seeing of you is, like, a sunset and a silhouette saxophone shot in front of the ocean. Like, it looked like <laughs> yeah. the announcement of your Yacht Rock album. <laughs> yeah, that was in South Padre. Um, that was in South Padre. My girlfriend came with us, and she was like, you need to do a sunset picture. You have a girlfriend so, now. That's I do. Are changing. Things are changing. Yeah, she's way she's a much better person than I am. So, oh, which is good. That's a good way to go. That's makes, a good. Makes went, you look better to up. others too. It's great. <laughs> she 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 like deals with all the makes. Yeah, just makes me a better human. She's a nurse, so she's really sweet and is just a good human being. So, but um, what you ask me about? Oh, towns touring Texas the small towns. Texas towns. You guys have been on the road, like kind of like a lot. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's weird. I just kind of tried to find places where like soul and rock and roll music would be able to show up and get paid and have people be excited about it, you know? And it's like, if I'm trying to play Austin or Dallas or Houston, I can get there once every couple months, but that's, it's really hard to build a career around those three towns. So I just started looking into like places like Denison, Texas or Amarillo or, you know, San Angelo or like, uh, whatever. And just seeing like, okay, what do they have going on here? You know, what does the community do? Right. So a lot of these, a lot of these communities have concerts. Um, so I started hitting up like the Chamber of Commerce or like the Parks and Rec Department and being like, "Hey, y'all have bands, right? Do you have money? Okay, let's do something." So that's kind of how it started, uh, and it just seems like it's actually a good way to get in front of people and get paid. Yeah, and then do you do you parlay that into other gigs, like in the towns, like? So, yeah, that's that's the hope. I mean, like we've a lot of these places we're hitting for the first couple times, you know, really the past year and a half we've picked up touring around Texas. I mean, touring like me booking shit and making things happen and just trying to get out there. So we're hitting these markets. You know, this is the first couple times we've been there. So what I'm doing is I'm just trying to get those people on our Instagram or our email thingy. Right. And then hit up the venue in town and be like, hey, let's do a show in a few months and sell tickets. That's kind of the hope. Because I don't really know what I'm doing. I'm just that's what I read about in blogs. So that's what other well, people do. Well, I mean, it, do. Seem, it seems like a, it. That seems to me when you explain it, it doesn't sound harebrained. It sounds uh, sounds logical. Like a logical way to do it, right? Because yeah. it's weird, right? Like when you're trying to start your career thing, like people want you to sell tickets, but like, how are you going to sell tickets in a town where no one who knows who you are? You I've know, never understood that. No, you're right. You're right. I feel like the thing where you say uh, when you start your career thing, I feel like the career thing is always in a perpetual state of starting. Right? <laughs> yeah. You know what it's I mean? Just one, yeah, yeah. It's just one thing and then the next thing and you're always just building, building, building. And yeah. it just feels like I'm treading water. But I guess if you look, you look back at your timeline and you're like, oh, I, there's been progress. So that's yeah. good. Yeah. Yeah, so. there has been progress, man. You've been putting out music. You've been coming on the show for a while. How long did we meet through an Austin Music Foundation uh, consultation? Yeah, we did like back in 2017 or maybe 2016. Uh, that was back when I was really crazy and I'd send people emails and Facebook messages at weird times about music stuff. Did I respond so, to you? You were cool. You were always nice to me. And I, I like even you. when I'm. Thanks, man. Thank you. I like you too. Well, yeah. ultimately, the fucked up thing is you are crazy, but we're all crazy. And I go go find any of your artist friends and like zoom in on their personality, and you're like, this person's fucking nuts. This person right. is fucking nuts. And we're quirky, and we're uh, what we call what it, it, a, a, glorif a glorified way to say it is, is we're eccentric. Right. Like we have eccentric right. personalities. But I right. I enjoy you. I like I like that you're driven. I like that you're really badass at at. You're you're a badass musician, and Thanks, you man. you put yourself in these positions. Like I remember talking to you the first time. A lot of your stuff you were doing was going on going on over on the east side with right. older African American musicians, kind of like taking yourself to school. Right, right. Yeah, I, I think that like if you're serious about you know like blues music or soul or, or roots music, you got to go find. Go to go find people that have done that, right, and, and have an understanding of it and have a respect for it. I think it's the same thing. Like if you're a chef and you want to go cook like Vietnamese food or something, right? You've got to go like study and understand it. Yeah. So, so that's kind of the way I've approached music. Like I always knew 
since I was a little kid, I knew that I liked rock and roll and like roots, rootsy kind of like African American, right? Inspired music. I just knew I liked it. You can dance to it. You feel it. It's awesome. And uh, I was kind of like, I remember I just read about the Rolling Stones and I was like, oh, Keith Richards used to go and like hang out on the East Side. I right, guess I'll go right, bring right. my sax. I'll, I'll go bring my saxophone and go hang out with Soul Man Sam and see what I can learn. Kind yeah. of thing. And what so, what what do you learn from from somebody like Soul Man Sam? Oh my gosh, have you seen him before? Have you seen him perform? Yeah, yeah. I think I learned a lot about uh, just being a band leader, how to uh, be an entertainer, right? And uh, also just how to deal with people with eccentric personalities, right? Because I came, you know, I came from one place, and then you talk to someone who's like, you know, Nick, get over here, bring that saxophone, get your ass off stage, or whatever. <laughs> and it's, um, <laughs> you know, he's or he's drinking uh, his Hennessy and he's got a cigar and he's walking around and he's blind, you know, so he's like bumping into stuff and talking to people and talking shit. And it's just like, you just learn to deal with all sorts of different situations and people and, and I think really enjoy it as opposed to being terrified. Well, I'm yeah. like, oh, this is crazy. This is crazy. I'm having fun, though. This is right. crazy, but it, it's fun. Right. It's fun. Like, yeah. So I learned a lot about how to hustle a tip jar, too. He's a uh, he's shameless about that. <laughs> well, and at, and at gigs that you end up, you know, when you go out and tour and play in these small places, a lot of times you have to play like two, three sets sometimes to get you oh, know get yeah. the money that you're there to to make, and and those kind of like tip jar things and making that a fun game for everyone to get involved in is a great game to learn yeah. how to play. Yeah, and it's and at some point you got to get over. I remember when I was first like you know the first couple of years I was playing with my band, I was really embarrassed when someone would like take the tip jar and like move it around, you know, I was like, Oh, you shouldn't make people, but it's like, no, that's like part of the game, right? Like you're, that's what you got to do. And soul man, Sam, you know, he'll, he'll go walk around at the tip bucket and be like, all right, this is the shit jacket. We're going to fill it up with your dollar shit. <laughs> Whatever you would say. <laughs> or he'd say, I'm not playing another song till I got $20 bills in here. And, um, <laughs> But people love it, and he just owns it. And I think that may be a big part of music is just owning what you're doing on stage and not not apologizing for it. Being like, hey, this is me. I'm weird. I'm doing this shit. That's okay. Yeah. Uh, how old are you, man? I don't even – I just turned 26. Okay. So you're a young guy. Still You're young, not messing but- around with one of those Ableton boxes on stage playing to tracks. Not that that's bad, but that seems to be what the younger folks – your age, maybe even a little bit older, but even younger. That's that they're in a in a groove where they're loop boxing and they're doing a you know what I'm saying? And you're here you yeah. come with this Soul Man Sam trip that even like your new record, <laughs> the the When the Bars Close is all super soul and like but like soul like uh sixties and seventies soul inspired record. Yeah. Yeah. I well you saw how much trouble I had getting a Zoom meeting going. So like <laughs> you know <laughs> <laughs> like if I was up there with a computer, oh my god! You know, trying to get like different things to run. So maybe that's what it is. I'm just creating a situation that I'm not going to fuck it up entirely. Um, but I mean, no. The serious answer, kind of to that to that idea, is is you know I grew up with the piano around my house all the time. My dad played piano, um, and he was a rock and roll kind of piano dude. And so I grew up listening to like Chuck Berry or Jerry Lee Lewis, Little Richard, uh, like all these you know all this uh, kind of really rhythm driven piano kind of rock and roll stuff. Yeah. And uh, I just remember when, as I kind of started to craft these songs and as, as the band came together and they added, you know, what their influences to the sound, the guys in the band, um, it was like, I think about like, Oh, what's a, what's a fun show I'd want to see, you know, what's a show I want to go to. Well, I want to see good rock and roll music. Cause that sounds fun. You know, <laughs> I started listening to like, uh, like Rod Stewart and the faces and, and that kind of early seventies stuff. And there's just so much energy. And I, I'd be thinking, I'm sitting there thinking like, man, if I saw this at a club, this would be really fun. Yeah. You know, why not? Why not do it? There's no one else doing it. Let's, let's, let's kind of go back in time a little bit. Did you ever, uh, did you ever get to see Ian McLaughlin play? I have not. No, when sir. he was alive? No, I don't know. Oh yeah. He died I'm, in 2014. Is this someone that I should know? Am I sounding like really it's ignorant? the keyboard right player now? from The Faces. Oh, okay. He lived then, here yeah, for a I long mean, time. He used to do fucking Thursday nights at Lucky Lounge. Oh my god, really? Yeah. Happy That's hour. Cool. That's awesome. No, I mean, like you know, with with regard to the the faces, you know, I, I just I listened to, uh, I got into all that that stuff and that sound. So I guess that even that keyboard playing, I didn't know who I was listening to, the name of the guy, but I was like trying to play like that. You know, somebody so. somebody just sent me some photos of him playing for me. 
He did oh, the cool. podcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. He uh So you took I took what? I was like, oh, so I'm on I'm on a podcast with some I was like, you got me on here. You must have had a you had to fill a slot. You had to I'm just being funny with you, but uh, we're not in person. He's, so he's actually a rock and he's actually a rock and roll hall of fame inductee. That's awesome. Yeah. 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 Pretty wild. Anyway, look, let's go back to this record. So you recorded it to tape to keep that thing. So did the band play live? Yeah. So we tracked it live as a four piece thing. And I even did it, you know, I sang live on all those tracks and I'm oh, playing really? piano live on all those. Yeah. So, which, you know, Nick, Nick, who is, is, runs Fifth Street Studios, I told him at the beginning of the session, you know, he had originally had the keyboard isolated in the vocal. We were in, I was in a booth and I was like, no, no, no. Like, I suck when I'm in a booth. Like, let's just all be in the same room. And he's like, OK, like, it's your money kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it worked out. I just I know I'm a better vocalist when I'm around my band and I can feel the drums and feel the bass like and, you know, look at everybody and, and interact and vibe. Yeah, uh, I get I get a lot better. I'm kind of not a great vocalist if I'm just by myself in a room. So, <laughs> like I, I've noticed that difference in energy. But yeah, we tracked it all in the same room with, the, and then we brought in the backup singers later. Okay, but uh, it was cool. Who sang backup on it? We well, got Kelly Kuhn and Tori Neiman, Victoria Neiman, and oh, nice uh, Kelly. Yeah. Kelly's uh, awesome, and she kind of ran the backup vocals things and would come to me with suggestions for parts and, like, demo out stuff. And then Victoria can sing super high and beautiful, and it was awesome because it uh, made Sounds us sound great. way cooler. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, Are you yeah. bringing them as part of the thing once the album comes out? Do they? Because I did that when I had backing back. You saw that time? Yeah. I had backup singers. Yeah. yeah, was that with Jane? Yeah, Jane and Jamie Harris, right? Yep. Sometimes it was yeah. some other people because those guys all do their own thing. Do their own thing. Yeah. Um, yeah, my, my hope, my thought would be like when we are able to schedule, because right now I'm in the process of scheduling, you know, shows in Austin to promote the thing, right? So that's what I'm saying. Like in the next month or so, we're going to do some shows to do album release stuff. Um, I'd You're like to have the only Tori. person that's come on here just been talking about like, and I'm trying to book some shows. Like, you know, like... <laughs> Where are you going to play, man? I mean, there's Far Out Lounge and stuff like that is going on. I actually went to a show there Friday, and it was it felt safe. It felt weird right. at first, just, but then it felt safe. Is is that the first time you've kind of been out recently, or like how how long? No, has it been since you've been? no, I've I've done some stuff, man. I I went to Blanco. I went to a backyard concert <laughs> there. Yeah, don't ask I've me. Been to Blank- like, look, man, it's been eight months. I've been to Blanco. I've been, I've been to Blanco, to okay. South Austin. I've been to uh no, I went to one of those drive in shows. I went to the Love and Light uh drive in show. Fantastic, man. Sorry, my phone's ringing. I forgot to turn it off. That's on. okay. I thought I did that, so I feel good. As long as it's not me, I'm okay. Uh that's a cool ringtone. So where are you yeah, it's uh it's uh it's it's Roxy Music. Are you a fan of Roxy Music? Do you know them? I know a little bit, but I need to be more educated. I've been, like I said, I've been kind of delving. They're a little, sorry, it, it ends now. <laughs> oh, I thought you were like showing me so I could jam. No, no, no. Jam I'm more. Keep on li- making you listen to it. Uh, you like Wurlitzer, man? What do you like better, Wurlitzer I do. or Rhodes? I think I like Wurlitzer better. I like that sound. Huh. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I like them. I have a Rhodes 54. That's kind of the size of a Wurlitzer. I don't know if you remember seeing it. I remember being at your place. I mean, it's been a couple years, yeah. right? I think I came over there like in 2018 or something. I don't even know. My 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 timeline is getting all compressed. I don't know. I'm getting old. So you're going to play shows. That's what we were talking about. <laughs> yes, I'm going to play shows. And so I am talking with the places where we have good fan bases to try to get things, I guess, lined up officially. That's that's really what's happening right now. So we've got a good fan base in Corpus in the Gulf Coast area. We've got a good fan base in the Austin area. So it's just a matter of getting the specific date right now. But then I'm also, I'm putting the album out as far as like, we're going to release singles on Spotify and things like that over the next month and things. Okay. Um, you know, I'm going to Galveston for the month of December. I my, didn't know that. My grandma got a beach house and oh, uh, cool. was like, whoever wants to come get a COVID test and come hang out on the beach. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. We're going to have Christmas at the beach house, the whole thing. It's gonna be great. That sounds wonderful. Yeah, I'm. Uh, I'm doing a bunch of podcasts now because I'm not going to be recording any new ones. I'll be doing the intros and stuff from there, but not. I'm going to take. You a see break. them lined up. Yeah. Well, I'm almost at a thousand, Nick. Whoa. Do you still like it? 
Yeah, of course I do. I wouldn't do it if I didn't <laughs> like it. So I just want to... let's get let's get back to this to this record. It's called When the Bars Close. Hopefully by the time this comes out, it'll either be out or it'll be coming out soon because I've got a pile of of shows, and this will come out sometime in December. Right. Um, right. Uh, and uh, and you guys are going to be trying to hit up some of these places that you've been playing. You uh, so Houston, Dallas, San Antonio, Austin. There are places and then Corpus. You, and then Corpus. And Cor- yeah. Yeah, those are places where I know we can move some tickets and people have been coming out to see us and so there's this is enthusiasm. What so, kind yeah. of what kind of place are you playing in Corpus? Like, the- like Sur- Surf Club, House yeah. of Rock, uh in Port A. Uh we've we found a couple of spots that just have like outdoor stages that work, but I'm talking to what is it, the uh the back porch or whatever like that. I think it's one of the venues where I can sell some tickets and get it. I know I can get some people out. So yeah. Okay. Well, I think the record, then, the record sounds great, and I'm glad you did it to tape. Was this 24-track, two-inch tape? Classic? Yes. Is that what we were dealing with? Yeah, yeah. And the, the only reason I know that is because Nick told me that as I asked him, because I don't know anything. And I was just watching the, I was just watching the well, tape I mean, by the time, do its thing. By the time you, 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 were, you were in recording studios, there, there wasn't tape machines. No, it's really weird to be in a studio where there's not a bunch of, of screen, like, like, like digital screens on, you know what I mean? Like the computers are all it's pretty off. pretty awesome. Isn't it? It's beautiful. You feel like you're cutting a record. You're like, Oh sh- damn. I'm like, Oh, we're cutting a record here. Oh my goodness. Let me ask you a question as a guy that's never had, had to wait for rewind. Was that a weird experience? It was. I liked it though. It's gratifying. Yeah. You okay. Oh yeah. Gives you a little suspense. I I think it's better, and you hear the like the yeah yeah the yeah, yeah yeah yeah. I think it's better. I think it sounds beautiful. It's just different, right? It depends on the, the band, but I, for us, it makes a lot of sense. So let's talk about the band, the Selfless Lovers. Basically, like you write the songs. You were the guy that started the thing. You're the right. guy. Basically, you're the guy talking at the shows. I've seen you. <laughs> Yeah, I talk too much. No, no, no. I'm the M- no, no. That's not what I meant. I mean, like, you're, <laughs> I know, the, guy, I... you're the guy telling the stories. Like, you're, you're the guy. That, that's a cool right. thing. You have a band, though, that, that you, you say, uh, you said in one of your paragraphs that you guys like each other. And so how does that work? <laughs> I think, okay, so I'll tell you about the guys. We, we got uh, Augie's our bass player, uh, Keegan's our guitarist, and Danny's our drummer. Uh, Danny's been playing with us for about almost four years. So really since the, the beginning where we started playing shows and um, I think we like each other just because we kind of all balance each other out. You know, Augie has a deep musical background, like where he's gone to, you know, he's gone to school for this stuff and uh, knows all the music theory and all those things. And Keegan's a dude who started playing blues at Skylark Lounge with Soul Man Sam, just like I do. So we kind of have that background. Oh, and then, awesome. uh, and then Danny, it's interesting. Danny's into like hip hop and like Ableton stuff. And we'll play a Rolling Stones song on stage and he'll be like, was that one of yours? And I'm like, no, that's, that's an old Rolling Stones song. And he's like, oh, I've never heard it. <laughs> I'm like, okay, cool. Wow. So it works. It's a nice group of people though. Cause we all have something to talk about and you know, we're not the same. So it's nice. Yeah. Also in there, you mentioned having rules about alcohol and drugs in the band. <laughs> yeah that's right i did send you a long email thanks for going through it um, well those are the things so, that interested me because i was like ah, i wonder if i get thrown out of his band <laughs> i think my rule with 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 drugs is basically like don't don't do it inside of the venue <laughs> like and also inside or inside well, in sight in sight like, okay don't, yeah, yeah, i don't want yeah, someone yeah. yeah so that's one of them and the other is like don't do so much that i know you're on something right like if I can tell, that's when not, a that's, drum. Those aren't like bad. Words. You made it out like you like no drugs in the thing. That's a, that's oh, like no. a pretty normal thing. Like don't fall down, <laughs> right? And and no. don't be doing like blow in the middle of the of the on the off the bar. Right. No, I think it's reasonable. I guess I don't know if I made it sound like I was like draconian. We're not. We're not like puritan. I'm kind of a nerd, and I don't really do any of that stuff at all. I just drink coffee on stage, and what? then I have a gin and tonic at the end of the show because I'm boring. There's nothing wrong with that. And well, I'm trying to, I've learned to loosen up a little bit more now with COVID because I think I appreciate the shows a bit more. What does your girlfriend think of that? Does she like Like the the music, the music, like have you guys been together when you were on tour and stuff or does she think you just hang out at home all the time? 
<laughs> so you think I just hang out, I bake cookies. <laughs> no, uh, I'm just very domestic. Um, no, she's she's super supportive. In fact, the way we met was she we were we did a so far sounds show like in April of, of last year. Uh-huh. And um she she really liked the band and came up her name is Bianca. She came up and said hi and was very sweet and very supportive of the band. And then she came to a show like a month later and she was singing songs of the band. Like she was singing the originals. And I was like, and I remember this girl's like, who is this person that knows our music? Like you know, like what she's singing original tunes, like deep cuts from two years ago. And uh, anyways, and that's what I knew. I needed to get her number and start talking to her because <laughs> she was really kind and the, liked the music. So that's a good start. But no, she's been super supportive and uh, is, uh, I think, totally on board because she knows that I approach it like a job. So it, it, it buys me a lot of time. You know, I'm not just I'm not just hanging out, uh, making phone calls and stuff and guys, trying to book us shows. Are you guys living together? Uh, basically, I mean, we still live in separate places, but we stay together pretty much every night. So you haven't like, had the talk of to, like, oh, well, you know, it's not save a lot on, we both save a lot on rent. That's always how it starts. That's the way, I don't know if that's a good, I don't know if that's a good way to do it. I feel like. <laughs> well, no, that's they, always they, what it like. Oh, yeah, my, oh, and we'd save a lot on rent. <laughs> like it's an economic decision. Yeah. That's what I think is funny about it. Okay. Well, actually, Johnny, the, what you're touching on is like, like, so I think it's good for us to have our space just like. Okay, with the band, like I mentioned how we still like each other. One of the things is like we still often will drive separate to shows. You know, and Dude, and, and Skyrocket. that allows us to Skyrocket's been to get sorry, nineteen years, and I'm pretty sure it's because we all drive ourselves to our shows. Dude, <laughs> it's huge. It's so huge. And it's like that, like just I like you know, before shows, like I like to hit up a nice coffee shop and hang out and the guys the other guys want to do something else. Right. So it's just good to have that freedom. Yeah. So the same reason is like not moving in together. It's like, yeah, maybe, you know, maybe we'll save on gas with the shows, but we'll all hate each other if we play a bunch of shows together. We'll, so, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I didn't know that you toured with Roxy Roca last year. I'd forgotten about it until I read that. Yeah. Do you want me to talk about it a little bit and tell you the deets? Yeah. Who did you, um, take, you took my friend Houston's place or were you way after Houston? Generations after out. Houston. I think I was generations. I think I was farther down the lineage. I think what happened uh, was there's a guy that I'm friends with named Errol. You know who okay, that guy is? Yeah, he his, was their bassist, right? No, no, he was a guitar player. He was. I bet his legend looms large in like late night van talks in that in that car. Anyway, is great is dude. Errol Greek? Is he Greek? No, he's Jewish. <sighs> okay. I'm anyway, bad. I, uh, yeah, he 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 was in the band. He's gone. My friend Christina that I played with with my all female band, she yeah. was a drummer for a while. She's gone. Houston played the saxophone. He's gone, and now the only guy I know is uh, is Ty. Yeah, yeah. So so I think I came in because they had a sax. Their saxophonist that had been there for a few years. Uh, I guess he just couldn't do it anymore. He had other stuff going on, and they were kind of like a month out from their tour. They like needed a sax player, and they were like, "Hey, can you learn like forty songs?" <laughs> And I was like, yeah, maybe I can learn like 28 of them. And that's kind of the way it went. So I, I, I practiced with, uh, with Mike, their trombonist, and he kind of showed me all the charts before we were getting ready for this tour. And I just tried to like learn everything, you know, but I, I don't read sheet music very well. So I was learning it by ear for the most part. So, which was kind of hilarious, but it's okay. It worked out. And then, and then we did a run, we did a run of the whole, of the whole South. So I got to see like South Carolina, North Carolina, Florida, uh, Arkansas, and all this stuff that I, I, you know, I've never really traveled. So it was awesome just to be out there in those towns and playing in those little venues. Yeah. How are they doing? So, are they doing good? Are you still playing with them officially or not? Or what's the story? N- n- no, after I got back, I mean, we got, I got back in at the, at the end of August and uh, I, I kind of had all this renewed energy for the selfless lovers because I was watching Tay, you know, run the band. And I was kind of thinking like, Tay, you know, I sorry, can I said stuff. his name wrong. Yeah, I was going to, I was going <laughs> to, you're good. Um, but uh, yeah, I think I learned a lot just about how to be a band leader, you know, and kind of like when you're doing this day in and day out, a lot of the little things that can either make or break a day or make it more reasonable, you know, because people's attitudes can, it's hard when you're, when you're together all the time. Um, but so I got back and I was just like ready to start booking shows for selfless lovers. So that's kind of what happened. And uh, yeah, so I haven't, I haven't played with them really in the past year. Okay. You yeah. miss it? But it. Uh, I don't miss being in a van with six people. No, 
that's where I was like, I was like, oh, I think we should just drive separate cars for as long as we possibly can. Are they still kicking that's... it? Are you you bros with them, or did that? Uh, did you get kicked out, or did you hate you hated the vibe? Or I don't think I got kicked out. No, no. I don't. Th- <laughs> <laughs> I don't think they hate me. <laughs> Look, I feel comfortable with you, and I like you, so that's why throughout the co- course of this conversation, it'll sound like I'm giving you shit. But I think for the listener, it'll pro- listener. Is this entertaining for you? Answer out loud. I- yeah, I think the listeners are calling in. The, yeah, the, the phones are off the hook right now. They're really into it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll field some calls for you. No, I mean, I, I think really what it was, and this is the issue, Johnny, with me playing in bands in general, is like I'll come in and be like, oh, I want to play sax. And then it re- what really what it really means is like I like being on stage doing what I do with the Selfless Lovers and being the guy. And I have a hard time not doing that. Yeah. So it was good for me to do like a little internship apprenticeship and learn how to do that but I probably wasn't a good fit for long term just because I, you know, I want to play the piano and I want to show people what I can do. Right. And, and, and that you, doesn't make you a good teammate. You know, that, that's hard to be a good teammate for very long if that's what you want to do. I know exactly what you, I too have done that a lot. Like with Ian Moore, with, there was this band Endo Sheen, my friend Casey McPherson and Nathan Harlan used to have. And I, I toured as like the guy that played all the extra stuff that was on the record. You know what I mean? And saying harmony vocals. Right. And, uh, and every time I did it, it was always for like, I'll do it for this tour, but I can't, right. I can't be like, I get excited to do it. But then after I've done it, then I'm like, yeah, I want to be the guy too, you know? Yeah. yeah. And it, it feels a lot like dynamics, like on a basketball team or something. It's like, you know, like you, you need the guy that can like play defense and make and win the game. I just like, I don't know. I like ripping a sax solo or like tearing it up or working a crowd. That's fun. Do you have to wear and, the suits? Uh, I did. Yeah, we had to wear the suits. They still do the suit life. And when you're in Florida oh, in like July in a suit, it it feels like a, I don't know how to put it. I'm trying to think of a good metaphor. I just remember I would I felt like I lost weight by the end of the oh, show. Dude, I saw them, the amount of sweat. Yeah, I saw them in the summer, like in August. And they were doing full suit regalia. Yeah. And this the sweat was coming through the suits. Right. Yeah, you can see that with Tay. Maybe that's one of the reasons Tay still he looks great, dude. Yeah, he the guy does has look like six pack he look he has six pack abs. And and maybe it's because Roxy Roca is just a front for him to get his workout in. Maybe so. Are those shows long? <laughs> Two hours, three hours? Yeah. They're three hour gigs. Shit. And you're doing you're doing four of those in a week or five. And um so th- I learned a couple things, right? Which is like if you can play a three hour gig, you can make money. Yeah. Um you also learn that you don't want to be doing that forever. That's hard. So with my band right now, we're doing a lot of stuff where we're doing these three hour shows, right? We'll go do three hours here. We'll do three shows in a row. We'll do two in Galveston and one in Austin. And we'll, each of them are three hour nights. And you're like, Oh my God, I, I better find a way to do hour and a half gigs at some point because this is hard. Right. But I mean, so, with those gigs, you can end up financing things like records. So you can go out and play other gigs that are right. Right. Yeah. They're, they're, they can be lucrative. Right. And that's the thing that even when I talk with other musicians in Austin who are like trying to start a band or trying to make money, I'm like, if you can play a three hour gig, you can get paid. Yeah. And if you can, if you can only do an hour set, it's really hard to make any sort of money at all. Well, plus staying in that three hour, three set zone or whatever, three hour zone. When, when you do go play like the set that I saw you play uh, at Antone's, that was like 40 minutes one time. Oh yeah. That, Fuck that, man. You just blow right through that. Oh, yeah. It's like, yeah, I remember. Yeah, it's funny now. We get like an hour hour slot or 45 minute slot. You feel like you've been like lifting weights, right? And then yeah, you get to go. You're, and, you keep, and then you come out and you're ready. Right. There's no dip in energy for you guys. Oh, no. Yeah. You're like, you'll get off stage. I remember my drummer's even like, he'll be like, wait, are we done now? And I'm like, yeah, that's it. And he's like, oh, shit. Like, you know, yeah, you feel like you've been working out and you're like ready, ready to rock and roll. So I think it's good for you. It's just hopefully we get to a point where we can sell some tickets and like not do that forever because my body might just break down. Yeah. So <laughs> we'll see. Yeah. It's a tough one, man. Um, yeah. Do you, are you doing any sideman stuff with anyone during this time or just focusing right now on the selfless lovers? The, really, the selfless lovers thing is taken up. It takes up so much of my time just because I spend probably five or six hours a day just on booking shows. You know, I still don't have an agent or a manager. And that was really one of the hopes of this album was to like be like, hey, look what we're doing now. You know, look, this is 
maybe we're viable to do more. But anyway, so I'm just I'm doing so much of the booking and then I'm still doing our artwork. Right. And then I'm still you're, you're a tremendous artist. I forgot to even bring that up. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I love your work. Yeah. And, um, you know, so that, I think that visual art stuff is, is uh, you know, another thing that I need to do more with. But uh, anyways, you were asking if I'm uh, doing Sideman stuff. I just haven't had time for it. Sure. Um, if Soul Man Sam decided to start playing shows again and was like, Nick, come on down. <laughs> I might Get do your it. ass on stage. Get your ass on stage. Come on. Time to go. <laughs> But, I like how that's a song. Time to go. <laughs> it's always <laughs> time to go. Um, I've also been doing the Mozart's piano thing. So during the holidays, I do some of that. Or like that, I don't know if that, that coffee shop on Westlake, they have a big Oh, yeah, that's deck. down the street from my, my friend Mark's place. So what do you do? You, yeah. You play? So yeah, I come in and I do like Christmas stuff, right? So I'll play jazzy, jazzy jingle bells or, uh, you know, uh, some of those traditional Christmas tunes, whatever it is. Right. And I kind of play in between their big light show. So all these right now they're doing it all social distance Christmas. So you have to make reservations and you know, all the things that you've seen, I'm sure. Um, but they've got a big old, you know, led light screen and people out there drinking hot cocoa and they have this light up grand piano thing. So if you see my Instagram, you see pictures of it. Um, and, uh, anyway, so I've, I've been coming in and playing like holiday piano music and that's a pretty good gig. So I do that, and then I do the selfless lover stuff. So I'm just kind of running around everywhere all the time. Who uh, did I ask you this before? Who's your what's who's your who's your favorite artist? Do you have a favorite? Can you say it? Like right now, in like, in the artist uh, artist in in visual art. Oh oh, um, I like Salvador Dali a lot. Yeah, he's good. I I don't know. I'm kind of square with the stuff I like. Like I like Norman Rockwell, which that's like super square, right? That's like 1950s. America. There's nice something. Paintings. There's something. Un, I mean, it's never gone away, so it's doing something right. I think it's something. There's something iconic about his ability to like have people pose. Like a lot of emotion that comes through in the way he poses people. Yeah. It's, it's just really, it just really makes me happy to look at that stuff. And I'm tired of art that makes me sad. Like, like I want art that makes me feel joyous. So I like Dolly. I like Norman Rockwell. I like Banksy. Like that's all super. I like cliche, Banksy. But I, my I don't fa- know. My favorite artist is Basquiat. Okay. I know Basquiat. Yeah. And yeah, what's yeah. cool is, have you heard the new, uh, you like the strokes? I like, I like some of the old strokes. I mean, I know indie stuff, but I'm not like, you know, I'm, most of my headspace is like dude, from, is it? It's all... I like, I think I like a lot of the stuff that came out in the early to mid two thousands. So I liked like, um, I don't know, like Edward Sharp and the magnetic zero. Oh yeah. They were good. I forgot about them. Yeah, like that kind of stuff. I liked that headspace. You had, Alabama, uh, Arkansas. Remember yeah, that, that yeah was, that was a good that song. That was cool. Or that was the sound spice. of music. That was the sound that it's gone now. It's like the that it's, was, it's like the dead mouth sound. All that stuff is gone now. Right, because I thought that that was actually a really cool festival sound. Like in bands like Feist. You remember that band? I loved like, her. Yeah, I loved right. her. Right. Uh, and uh, you had that going on. And then you also had like, you know, people like Nora Jones and Sarah Bareilles were big too. And, you just had a lot of interesting, and I think early Foster the People was cool. Yeah. And it was cool pop. Like, it was good. And that's what I said to you, because I guess, Johnny, you kind of write pop songs, but I really like it. You know, it's like really good pop music. I don't know how to put it otherwise, so I hope it's not offensive. But it's like, you know, I really like the songs I get in my head, and I Thanks, like it. Thanks, man. Thank you. And that's kind of, Likewise. I remember when I, thank you, yeah. And I remember when I was listening to Foster the People, like some of their early stuff, I was like, oh, I actually, I really enjoy these songs. These are cool. And this yeah. is a cool sound. This is a cool. So, um, anyways, I liked a lot of the indie stuff from like 15 years ago. I don't really know. What, I don't even know what's out now. I guess I like Chris Stapleton. He's cool. That's totally different. But I can't think of any artists right now that I'm super. I like Gary Clark or you know Nathaniel Rateliff. Or the Black Pumas are cool. Stuff Black like that. Pumas are really cool. Like yeah, they're, they're also doing a take on what a new people do with classic soul. Don't right. you feel like that? Yeah, and I think that's maybe a lot of the gist of doing music in a way that's interesting is you're not gonna like you're not reinventing the thing, right? You're not gonna reinvent the wheel. I hate I wanted to use something cooler than that, but uh, <laughs> but um, you just kind of take a unique take on it, and it seems like they've kind of and also Eric's voice is just so good that he can kind of do whatever the hell he wants to do. It's incredible, right? Incredible I, I'm at a co- I'll, I'll be at coffee shops like working on my booking, and I'll hear Eric Burton just singing, and I'm like, oh, there he is. What do you mean, like so. just in a coffee shop singing? No, like, like I hear it on oh, the radio. 
<laughs> now you're on the right sorry yeah i should have played that no but i'll just be like working somewhere like just sending emails and then i'm like oh i know that guy's voice i was gonna be I like that like i think they were on like james corden last night you know what's crazy is eric was he was singing at like three or four years ago he was playing guitar and singing outside of like whole foods like for one of their you know when they would have artists come in and play i remember talking to him and he had like cds for sale it's it's wild so that's pretty awesome what he's been able to do. I remember seeing Adrian at this show that uh, it was Money Chicha when he was still playing with those guys. Okay. And uh, and he was like, oh, yeah, I'm doing this thing. You know Eric? And I was like, no. He's like, oh, you should come and check it out, this thing we're doing at Sea Boys. We just started like we played a couple weeks ago. It's real cool. I'm like, okay. Their third show or something. I couldn't even get in. Yeah, it was unbelievable. I actually had first, I, so I was playing saxophone with Los Coast for a bit. Oh yeah. And so I remember we oh, right. like were the we were the opener for one of the Black Pumas' first shows, and um, you know you're just looking around and it's like, oh wow, this is interesting. <laughs> like, what's happening? <laughs> like, I remember I showed up at the gig. You know, I showed up with my saxophone. I didn't know anything that was happening, and I just like see all these people around, and I'm like. I mean, Los Coast has a fan base. I like, guess not what I meant, but it's just like it was. It was weird, right? There's people Coast, everywhere. Yeah, they also got like a thing going on. I don't know. I haven't talked to them in probably. A year. I haven't seen Trey in probably a year or so. I but, haven't uh, seen him. In, I, I saw him at Christmas. No, I saw him at that party. Remember? Remember? Weren't you at that party? At uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that sounds you know like the beginning of like a. That sounds like the beginning of a bit. Like, weren't you at the party? Uh, you? you know that time I was drunk at that place. Um, <laughs> what? I forgot the name of it. Native Hostel. Remember at Christmas oh. time? That's when I. That's the last time I saw you. Oh yeah, yeah. And Trey goes to a lot of that stuff. No, I saw I've Trey that Lost night. Coast. Yeah, Lost Coast. I mean, they're another one of these bands, right? That like they're doing kind of soul with an indie psychedelic kind of feel, but the right. songs have catchy hooks. But I think a lot of it comes down to having a song with a catchy hook. Yeah. Uh, um, it seems to me like a lot of people that are really singer songwriter e. They might kind of shoot them, and I'm not trying to sound whatever. Like I don't know what the hell I'm talking about, but it seems it can make things more difficult to catch on if you get so into the singer songwriter that you forget to write a chorus. Right, right, right. And I, and I feel like I see that a lot, where it's like, wow, this is beautiful art, but I don't know if I could tell you how this song goes. Right. So that's kind of my litmus test for when I'm writing songs is I have to be able. If someone is like, okay, how does the selfless lover song go? I have to be able to hum it. Yeah. Right. Or else like, what, what am I for myself? Like, what am I making? Like, it's, I don't know what, how I, you know, get other people to listen to it. But yeah. Yeah. I know what you mean. And it's probably not singer songwritery as much as just like boring people that don't know how to write songs. <laughs> right. Well, cause singer songwriters obviously know how to write a song. Right. I guess right. What yeah. I mean. That's what I was saying. Cause like a lot of times those guys are the best songwriters, but you know, I know exactly the people that are trying to do it that don't get it. Right. I guess. Okay. So that's probably, let me rephrase it. I guess it's a fine line. Right, because if you you can be really interesting and artsy and poetic, but you've also got to be able to make a vehicle by which people can, like, it can get in their head and they can sing it again. You're right. So that's kind of I guess the line to try to because when I was first writing, I didn't I was trying to be too clever. I remember I do that a lot. I get in my own way. I try to be too smart. Yeah. So do you, do you write often? Are you a wake up and write every day guy? Or are you? <sighs> I think I think I'm a I think I do it based on how I feel like it's kind of like a week to week thing just because some weeks like if, if shows are happening again and there's and there's there's opportunities I'm going to try to pitch us to do shows right and then when there's when I and then I'll sometimes I'll be driving around at night or I'll be on stage and I'll feel inspiration to write and then I'll kind of get in that headspace again so a lot of the songs that I come up with are when we're on stage I'll just kind of come up with ideas and then later I'll sit down and like flesh it out that's awesome man yeah keeps that you know, live feeling in what you're doing you know all the way from the you know spontaneous thing on stage to a song you know yeah and i think a lot of it is it's interesting how like the mind works and the emotions you kind of have this interaction of your emotions and also your mental thing right right and you're kind of trying i guess to have a good song you're trying to interpret what you feel and interpret it in a way that makes sense once you sing the damn thing so if you it's like if you don't flesh it out enough, you end up with something really like derivative and like, you know, like love is love. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, 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 yeah. But but if you get in your way too much, you try to use some sort of metaphor that's real artsy in that. So, yeah. So I try to do the live thing just so I don't overthink it. 
Yeah. I'm like, I try to go with like a gut impulse and, yeah, then, yeah. and then maybe make it prettier later. Yeah. It ends up being, I do that too. Not on stage, but like when I'm writing, uh, my usual first pass of, of lyrics is just mumbling things. And then you hear words and you're like, oh, that's it. And then you're like, oh, wait a minute. That's a sentence. You know what I mean? Right. And you're like, right. that's really what I'm thinking. I'm just don't want it to come out. Yeah. You it's know? like you're, it's the sub, it's a subconscious presenting itself or something. I don't know. Dude, Songs are weird like philosophical, that. Philosophical, bro. Songs are weird like that. They're a philosophical, it can be a philosophical endeavor. Yeah. It's a weird thing. It so. is. So, uh, great job. The record, When the Bars Close, will be dropping in December, but you'll be dropping singles as you go. It's a 12 song record. Find you guys at the selflesslovers.com. You're on all the uh, social media outlets. Yeah. Yeah. We're pretty big on our Instagram. I try to keep that up. So, it's The Selfless Lovers Music. The Selfless Lovers Music on Instagram. Yeah. Yeah. I try to keep that up to date because I'm I, I can only juggle so many, and then I forget what the hell I'm doing. I'm sorry, man. I'm just joking, <laughs> uh, dude. I'm happy. I'm happy you met Bianca. I'm happy that you have a girlfriend. Things are going good. I yeah. need a poster of that saxophone uh, silhouette Do you want photo. It? If you can have yeah. some kind, even just a photo made for my fridge, I could do that. People could be yeah. like, "Who's that? Who's that? Are you wearing a shirt in that photo?" I, I I wanted to lie and say I'm not, okay. but I am. I'm clothed. I'm clothed. Well, I maybe think that one works day out. that works out for me. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, well, dude, it's been great talking to you and catching up with you. <laughs> yeah, man. You too. Yeah, man. It's great. Um, I, I I miss seeing you. I've always liked. Uh, I've always liked hanging out and talking to you. I enjoy yeah, your band. You too. Yeah. Thank you. Glad we're friends. Thanks for taking. Yeah, me too, man. Well, yeah. I hope to see you in the world sometime. Well, stay in uh, touch. I miss that. Let me know yeah. if you get a gig doing this thing at a safe place, and I'll go and be safe. Cool. Thanks, All right. brother. Dude. All right. Take All right, care. Buddy. Bye, buddy. Peace. Nicholas Parr from The Selfless Lovers, their record, When the Bars Close, out this December. Maybe it's out now. Who knows? Go to the selflesslovers.com and, uh, and get involved with the selfless lovers. Always great catching up with Nick. I love talking to that dude. He's a great, great guy. He's a great guy. I like being friends with him. I'm glad he's around. Glad he's making music. I'm glad they put out when the bars close. Don't forget, get out to the selflesslovers.com. Find out if they're coming to a town near you. I, uh, and don't forget when you're out there checking out the selflesslovers.com, you can find our podcast wherever it is that you find podcasts. New shows every Tuesday and every Friday. Sometimes we drop three a week. In that case, they'd be Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, just like a college course. What? That's crazy. All right, man. Let's hear the rest of this song from the Selfless Lovers from their new album, When the Bars Close, out this December. Let's get down. When the bars are closed. I'm thinking about you, baby I'm thinking about you, baby 